ambition and demagogy are our important points in this play. Caesar is not presented as a complex, attractive, even humane character which historical fiction has shown so far. Macaulay's man is shown both as a warm and fair statement, whose ambition is justified and indulged with, indulged with throughout the whole saga. Rex Warner's and Thornton Wilder's scissors are quite conscious of how much of a turning point for their lives and careers eh, the Ides of March may happen to be. Rex Warner's novel stands alone the whole night before, before the Ides of March dealing with Caesar's memories of his life. Wilder's Eyes of March also are, um, is also told by the protagonist that his account is centered on his emotional experience. We could also mention Calpurnius' dream, Calpurnius' dream's dictator, as a man whose harsh irony and glimpses of warmth while expressing his tenderness for his wife or sweet memories of Gaddis mix up with his own frailty. But Shakespearean character, the Shakespearean character, remains as a dictator figure, somehow aware of his significance as a ruler. He is not aware of his own physical limits. He is shown as an aging man by Cassius, as we know, but even too old to clearly show his ambition, something that seems to be monopolized by Cassius and Canning Antony, though they are on opposite parties. Cassius speaks as a sort of spokesman for the so-called Boni. The optimates were those who had rallied around Cato, defending all good Rome's deeply rooted republican values, what they considered to be mos maiorum, our elders' customs, of which Caesar seemed to be a predictable enemy. On the grounds of aiming at renewing the whole of Rome, he would be trying to build himself a stairway to reach the highest peak, that is, becoming a new king, as Shakespeare Caesar's acknowledges, since he expects to be offered a crown by the Senate, by the senators on that ominous day, I mean, the Ides of March. Decius openly mentions that the Senate have concluded to give this day a crown to mighty Caesar. It happens on Act 2, Scene 2, something that can be hinted at thanks to Caesar's attitude towards all those who have taken away the crowns that had been set around the heads of Caesar's statues all around the Forum. No doubt he spoke out of his own principles, but as Plutarch really says, clearly says, he was a man, he, Brutus, I mean Cassius, was a man of violent temper and rather a hater of Caesar on his own private account than a hater of tyranny on public grounds. This is what Plutarch says to us. The reason was that Caesar had deprived him, Cassius, of a praetorship in order to favor Brutus. Though Cassius had, Cassius had claimed his brilliant and spirited exploits in the Parthian War, he then disguises his thirst for vengeance by trying to destroy Caesar's myth, underlining his physical frailties, in order to convince Brutus by appealing to his duty as a descendant of the first Junius Brutus, who had firmly fought the Tarquins, the last Roman kings. He even tries to demolish that alleged divine ancestry that Caesar himself had devised long before, during the funeral speech in honor of his aunt Julia, when he had claimed his family to descend from Eulo, Aeneas' son, and therefore Venus' grandson. Cassius dares comparing Caesar to Anchises, Aeneas' human father, while he, uh, Cassius, quite like Venus' son himself, Aeneas, had tried to rescue Caesar from driving in the waves of the river Tiba. His sardonic irony regarding Caesar's ancestry is also shown when he misconsiders, when he undervalues the importance of his name. He would say, what should be in that Caesar? What should this name be sounded more than yours? At once in two. Brutus, on the contrary, does not hate Caesar, but only hates could, what could come out in the following days, though he is reluctant to take actions against him due to Caesar's bountiness to him and his loving care for him, but he fears that once found, once Caesar has been crowned, this fair chieftain 
may turn into a poisonous being for Rome, as he points out in that chain of metaphors Brutus develops in his most famous soliloquy, the night before the Ides of March, in which the noun the crown Caesar is going to be bestowed is an ada and all those things, signs that have be held so far are no more than a sort of serpent's egg which once hatched may outlash disaster for them all. What's more, the allegory of their staircase he envisions is no more than Caesar's apparent denial of everyone else's desire of crowning him at the Lupercalia, though the decision of appointing him as a lifelong dictator had been the Senate, something which Antony would handle for his funeral speech that loneliness will be used by Antony to move mass, uh, to move Roman common people against the conspirers by remembering Caesar's generosity for them all shown in his will, according to which each Roman citizen should be given 75 drachma and the dictator's private gardens would be bequeathed to Roman people. Antony does not accuse the conspirers himself. It's he who changes the mob's opinion through his speech. He keeps calling cases and Brutus honorable men so as not to be accused of slandering. Shakespeare shows us how easy it is to handle what Tasca calls the rabblement, that is, all that mass of Romans who lived away from luxuries Palatine Hill, mostly secluded in those claustrophobic human hives called insuli, mainly maybe mostly from Caesar's birth neighborhood, Sabura. Who knows if what Antony aroused was that feeling of bitter sadness that had been lying inside each of those humble men and women who had somehow lost one of those who had shared their late daily lives many years before.